Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and good. Um, welcome to the Graduate Students Seminar. Uh, this event is in cooperation with the DLSU Feminist Philosophy Graduate School class and the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. So the idea to come up with this seminar came about after a small class pseudo conference with graduate students attended by myself, uh, Hazel Biana, Dr. Gina Opiniano, and Ms. Sally Domingo. Oh, by the way, according to the Urban Dictionary, a seminar is a discussion or meeting about feminism. So anyway, we decided that it would be interesting to share some of the papers to the public to illustrate various ways and trends of thinking feminism and gender. Incidentally, it is also feminist activist and cultural critic Bell Hook's 68th birthday today. And what better way to celebrate her life and her works? So, so happy birthday, Bell Hooks. So you might notice that all of our speakers are male. Um, this is a function of the composition of the class. Um, but it does, this doesn't mean, though, that males cannot engage feminist topics. No? A common misconception which we would like to debunk. So on this Friday morning, let us give our thanks to our speakers who have agreed, agreed to share their time with us. So as for the format of our seminar, our three speakers will each present their papers, after which an open forum will follow. You may send your questions through the Zoom chat box or comment section of our FB Live. May we also request everyone to please mute your audio and hide your videos as courtesy to the speakers. Now please allow me to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Aaron Micah Esteban. So he's an ass assistant professor in Assumption College, Makati, and is currently a PhD student in philosophy at De La Salle University, where he also received his master's degree in philosophy. His publication and research areas include digital game studies, philosophy of mind, and artificial intelligence. Apart from his academic duties, he spends most of, most of his time playing visual novels and RPGs. Francis Kenneth Raterda, our second speaker, um, took his undergrad degree in philosophy at De La Salle University. He is currently taking his MA and PhD in philosophy at BLSU. His current research interests are on the philosophy of fashion, metaphysics, and the philosophy of science. Rodney De Leon is an educator and took his undergraduate degree in secondary education, major in English, at De La Salle University. Because of his interest in philosophy, he is now taking his master's and PhD in philo at the same university. His current research interests are on sexual ethics, mostly based on Wojtyla and Aquinas' philosophy. So may we please call on uh, Mr. Aaron Esteban to start with our first lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Biana. Uh, I will be sharing my PowerPoint now. Um, so is it sharing? Yes, please proceed. All right. So my research is entitled Exploring the Gender-Based Interplay of Modern Role-Playing Games. Um, the goals of my research is to draw on Judith Butler's theory of performativity and as I expand the understanding of modern role-playing games as an embodied performative practice that provide opportunities for alternate, uh, alternate gender performance. I also want to analyze the inclusive mechanics of a virtual environment as a space for exploring, as a space for exploring identities and standards outside of what society considers normal. Uh, you would see later on how the potential of different uh, activities can be done in these virtual environments, specifically role-playing games. So I'm going to start with the theory of performativity uh, as my framework. Uh, what is the theory of performativity by Judith Butler? Uh, for her, there is no objective ideal gender uh, aspires. That means that there is no essence that expresses or externalizes gender. Uh, you might have the idea that probably gender is socially constructed, but for Judith Butler, it's something more than being socially constructed because gender is the act that is uh, constructed regularly 
and somehow it conceals its uh, origin or genesis. And in, in the series of acts and rep repetitive acts in constant uh, uh, in constant with, with the agent's performance of gender, um, gender becomes real because it is performed. Uh, this leads us to the idea of what we call sedimentation. What is sedimentation? So just like the, the picture on the lower right, uh, these uh, tiny bits uh, of, of debris or sand or rock or whatever material it is that gets deposited uh, underneath the body of water would eventually uh, manifest to or crystallize into a future island or rock or whatever uh, uh, big material that you could think of. Uh, the same thing with gender is that the series of tiny acts that we build over time would create the legacy of a gendered body. Now, we are those tiny actions that somehow sediment into a bigger one. So that's, that's why you can't really pinpoint a particular act or a particular behavior because it's a combination of uh, actions that build over time. So uh, performance does not express real gender identity. It creates gender identity. There is no real or true gender. There is only the act of performing it, hence uh, the theory of uh, Butler's performativity. And this means that gender is both socially uh, established and performed with a little bit of cons uh, making constant changes and eventually uh, that would be uh, what your gender identity would be. So it is already and always will be an imitation uh, with no uh, fixed nature because in the first place, it was just an imitation to begin with. So what about virtual environment? So that's the framework we're going to use and we're going to apply it with the virtual environments in what role-playing games or particularly mo modern video games offer. And most role-playing games offer a variety of, of uh, safe environments. And in this case, the virtual environment presents the players the opportunity to take on a role or an experience firsthand and could bring them different choices. And by exploring these uh, identities you know, to take on a role, the players have the opportunity to assimilate their own sense of self on what is employed in virtual situations. I'm going to give you examples later on on how this is applied on particular games. Uh, I chose two most popular games later on. I will be introducing that to you later. So what about the gender identities in these uh, in virtual environments? How does it manifest? So games can establish or problematize the concept of gender so long uh, as the same as it could maintain or contest it. Players are free to explore and act in any way they want regardless of the starting point. Um, the game might have a particular uh, gendered roles at the start of the game but regardless of uh, what the game presumes it is still the freedom of the player to perform the, the game so different gender identities can be explored in independent of the pre-assigned gender roles of the narrative uh, the environment gameplay and narrative play vital roles in the construction of a player's in-game gender identity uh, so how is a game uh, normalized, the culture in the game? Um, how would you be part of the virtual environment and see that you, the, the role you're playing uh, coincides with what the game wants or what you want and how it corresponds with your understanding of uh, the narrative? Well, the game has a set culture and the player finds out through a series of challenges and players are rewarded for the following rules, uh, for following ru the rules of the game. So. When the game repeats over and over, it settles uh, within the environment and the player perceives everything eventually as something normal. Yeah. Uh, think about how gender is uh, perceived as uh, gender roles or performances are perceived as eventually normal in real life as well. 
when in this case, playing a video game is grounded on repetitive actions. Uh, just like what uh, Butler is uh, uh, contemplating on gender performativity. As the player is being trained to act in a specific way in in game in a, in a game world that follows predetermined rules. Now, sometimes there are uh, variations in games that doesn't allow you to act in a certain way, even though you want to, and those are some certain constraints. You could see it as kind of like the uh, social constraints that uh, prevents you to somehow challenge different gender notions. Uh, this leads us again to the idea of the embodied performance. The player uh, or the, the player playing the game is an embodied performance, uh, performance of uh, practice. Instead of being a passive observer, the player actively participates and takes on a role with their own sense of agency. Uh, in repeated playthroughs, uh, players may pick up cues from video game characters or narratives such as the non-playable characters or uh, NPCs and they could construct their own cognitive script about gender roles and sexual objectification. So how does this work now? Um, here's an example of a very popular game, The Witcher 3. Yeah. So you play as that guy, uh, Gerald. Uh, Gerald. However, uh, the game somehow leads you to see that he might be a womanizer and you might want to play his role. However, it was praised to somehow uh, populate the game and its narrative on the empowerment of women and that most of the leaders here are actually women. However, the in-game constraint is that you might still lead to believe that you have to, to see the, the, the weaknesses of women instead of their strengths. So that's one of the dangers here. However, uh, we're talking about the potential of a game to transcend to those uh, in-game culture uh, or, or values. Um, here's a, a, an example of, a ch of the choices that you could make. And I mentioned earlier that the repetitive actions and rewarding uh, behavior of the player could lead to that same behavior re re uh, repeated over and over until they see it as normal. And in this case, uh, the main character is having a, a choice, a dilemma, into either helping the woman in need eventually becoming his or her partner in the whole game. So you have choices here on who you want to be with and who you want to date and probably spend time with. And, and there are some queer characters as well, but that would be for another uh, material. Here, this is another game called Skyrim. And you would be amazed on how many hours, or at least um, one hour or two, where players try to construct their own uh, avatar just so that they could look like these. Yeah. Different races and so on. But the question still remains. Uh, how does the player perform their gender roles here? How do they represent themselves? And in the virtual environment, uh, they could be any of those gendered identities. And now, take note, uh, I only use single player games here, but there will be more uh, uh, pathways in research via multiplayer games. So just imagine, if the research is applied on multiplayer games and how gender identities and gender roles is, is conceived or constructed through a multiplayer game. So uh, here are some of the quests and the quests would lead you to either uh, progress within the culture, uh, the culture of the game and learn about the lore and the narrative eventually being part of the game itself and you would have this separate identity that you could play around with. So in conclusion, role-playing games for its virtual environment, which is culture, narrative, and gameplay, uh, assist in providing imaginative methods which lead to the transmission of information and uh, opportunity of its accessibility to players that contribute to the construction of gender identity. Well, the assimilation of the newly 
presented ideas and experiences within a virtual environment could proceed to overcoming a player's perception of different issues, such as cultural hindrances, um, uh, gender representation, and gender roles. And that ends my uh, presentation for this morning. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Esteban. May we call on um, Mr. Francis Raterta for his presentation? Thank you, Doc Biana. Um, I'll start sharing my screen now. Can, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes, please proceed. Thank you. Okay, uh, so good morning, everybody. Today, I'll be presenting my uh, paper called Visible Signifiers, Recognition and Unrecognition, Problematizing Biana and Joaquin's Gender Galaxies. So this will be the outline of my uh, presentation. First, I'll be discuss the, discussing Ashley Talkert's fuzzy gender model, the model which uh, Biana and Joaquin um, argue against. Next, I'll discuss Biana and Joaquin's proposed alternative model, the metaphorical gender galaxies. Third, um, I aim to establish a connection between what is visible and uh, what its uh, connection is with uh, recognition. That's, that's going to be tackled in the third section. Lastly, I'm going to present my identified problem with, uh, gen with, the, with these uh, metaphorical gender galaxies by um, incorporating the, the ontology to lesbian, to, uh, to, uh, to lesbian galaxies. So let's start. So what is the fuzzy gender model? According to Ashley Talkert, the model represents other genders as fits or fuzzy units located in between a gender line. So in this gender line, male and female are at the opposite ends of the line and treated as special cases. This uh, model said to disempower the male-female binary, and it accounts for while decentering hegemonic sexual binarism. So this is what the model might look like, or is wherein the male and female are at the opposite ends, and all other possible gender categories that we can think of will be points or units in between the lines. So gays, um, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, well, so on and so forth. So this is actually, uh, I googled up uh, gender line. This is what came up. So this is basically what uh, the fuzzy gender model uh, looks like. So what's wrong with this uh, model, the fuzzy model, according to Biana and Joaquin? Biana and Joaquin argue that the fuzzy gender is problematic for two reasons. Number one, the model is self-defeating because it still defines the other genders in terms of the male-female opposition by treating the binary as special cases. So, may privileging pa rin for the binary by putting them at the opposite ends of the spectrum and calling them special cases. Next, the model is theoretically inert. Since, since it admits of an infinite number of gender categories, but fails to give a voice to each possible gender gender category. So again, if we consider, for example, number three and number four, according to the model, the fuzzy model, in between number three and four, there there exists um, more finite, uh, more diluted um, gender categories. So sobrang dami talaga na possible gender categories. And according to Biana and Joaquin, if Tucker's goal is to give a voice to each possible gender category, she might fail to do so. So they propose an alternative model, which they call the gender galaxy model. So in this model, 
each gender category will be treated as an independent galaxy within a single vast gender universe. So the gay galaxy, the gays would have their own galaxy, the lesbians would have their own galaxy, and uh, so on and so forth. Subcategories of each gender will fall under their respective galaxies as galaxy systems. So for example, bears, twinks, twunks, these would all be considered galaxy systems under the gay galaxy. So what more can be said about the model? So a key, the key aspect of this model is that each galaxy is said to be socially conferred. Meaning to say, what a given galaxy is like will ultimately depend on how a given society places them. So, in this case, gender galaxies are highly context dependent. So, different societies may recognize each gender each gender galaxy differently. So, for example, um, the Philippine society might uh, recognize the gay community or the gay galaxy in a different manner compared to, for example, um, the Canadian society. Last, they're also flexible in that people in a society can always redefine how they recognize the galaxy. So, next, let's talk about some uh, uh, bits on recognition and visible signifiers. Let's start with the rainbow pride flag. Notice that a key aspect of the six colored pride flag is that the political aspirations, societal goals, the identity, the unity of the LGBTQIA community is perfectly encapsulated in a single visible item which takes the form of a flag which bears the rainbow colors. Okay? So given this, there is there seems then to be a connection between what's visible such as clothes and colors, with one's identity and social and political concerns and aspirations. In strategizing visibility, in making visible these things, the subject is able to express their, number one, individuality, and number two, their membership with the community which they identify with. So how, is, how does this relate to recognition? Well, according to Samantha Brennan, Strategizing visibility is intimately linked with the quest for recognition. I make visible these things, my, my societal uh, concerns, my political aspirations, my identity, because I want to be recognized as belonging to that community which I identify with. So, according to Brennan, recognition has two aspects. Recognition within one's community and recognition by a larger community. So, Given all of this, what, how can we problematize the topology of gender galaxies? So, I raised the problem with the socially conferred aspect of gender galaxies. Recall that each gender galaxy is uh, dependent on how a given society recognizes them. So, since there is a connection with visibility and recognition, signifiers. Okay? So, according to Lisa Walker, though performing the visible can be politically and rhetorically effective, it is not without its problems. A given identity that invests certain signifiers with political value, figures that do not present those signifiers are often neglected. So, how do we so what I'm trying to say is, the, when a society uh, recognizes, uh, recognizes a given galaxy, for example, based solely on the signifiers that they wear, it runs the risk of excluding members who do not bear those signifiers. So a perfect example would be if we consider the the lesbian galaxy. So in the lesbian galaxy, uh, we have different subcategories or uh, galaxy systems. We have the lipstick lesbians, chapstick lesbians, boy lesbians, 
butch, and so on and so forth. So, according to a study done by Blair and Hoskin in 2015, they conducted a study involving um, 147, if I'm not mistaken, um, femme-identified individuals. And what they found out is that coming out as femme is a different experience from coming out as a sexual minority. So it is easier to come out as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or other uh, gender categories than it is to come out as femme. So in, the, in, the, in their paper, they also highlighted that the butch look or uh, lesbians who dress in a particularly masculine manner is seen as the paradigm in terms of how lesbians ought to look if indeed they want to be recognized as lesbians. So we can already see what kind of implications this uh, stereotype is on the, or, or how this would impact those femme lesbians. So the queerness of femme lesbians would be questioned since they dress in a typically feminine manner, they, they're, uh, not only will people outside the LGBT community question whether, whether or not they are indeed lesbian, but lesbians, the other lesbians themselves, or the, for example, the butch lesbians, might question a femme lesbian whether or not she is in fact a lesbian. So, femmes are only lesbian through her association with the butch. So, prevalent yung notion that um, uh, if you're a lesbian, you ought to look or uh, you ought to look like a butch. So, more problems for the femmes. Femmes are forced to adopt a butch or even androgynous aesthetic. Kasi nga, they want to be seen. They want to be recognized as lesbians. Femmes go out of their way to be identified as queer or lesbian or bisexual. There's a conflict. Eh. There's a conflict between your self-expression, your gender expression, how you want to represent yourself. But on the other hand, you want to be seen as belonging to the community that which you identify with. So let's uh let's take this point and uh put it into context in the um, gender galaxy ontology. So let's say merong society on the lower right hand of your screen. My society and it recognizes the lesbian galaxy as having a set of societal concerns, issues, needs, political aims. But let's also say that this given society holds on to the notion or adopts the notion that lesbians ought to look butch or lesbians ought to look masculine. Now, the problem with this confirmation is that it assigns the butch look as a property which the entire lesbian galaxy has. So, so in this case, ang nare-recognize lang, the only ones getting recognized by, by the society are those who look butch or those who dress in a masculine manner. Whereas yung mga, those, the femmes, the, those who dress in a feminine manner, they don't, uh, they, they fail to, be, to get recognized or they remain unrecognized or invisible. So I argue the process of social conferment fails when the means of recognition, for example, the signifiers, is over-identified with the galaxy it represents. So as I mentioned, yung, the bush look, the bush aesthetic is so overly identified with the lesbian galaxy that anyone, that any lesbian who, do, who does not um, resemble the butch um, is not recognized or is not acknowledged as a lesbian. This runs the risk of excluding members who do not bear the signifiers. So just to end my uh, report, um, we talked about, let me just summarize what we uh, talked about today. First, I discussed uh, the fuzzy gender model, wherein the gender, gender, other gender categories are represented in a line wherein the male and the female are at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Next, we discussed Bianna and Joaquin's 
um, identified problems with the fuzzy model and their proposed gender galaxies, which, uh, as it turns out, is uh, very socially socially conferred and is highly context dependent. Last, uh, third, we established the connection between recognition and the uh, visible signifiers. Lastly, we um, I uh, talked about my uh, identified problems with the gender galaxy model by uh, applying it to the lesbian galaxy. So uh, that's my presentation. Thank you and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Francis. Uh, may we call on Rodney for his presentation? Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm about to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Hello, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes. please proceed. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Okay, name is Rodney DeLeon. I'm going to be presenting about the Expounding the Feminist Critique on Pornography, a reply to Coston. So to give you all an idea, an idea of how my presentation will go by, here's an outline. First, I'll be presenting for an introduction the paper of Amanda Coston, a feminist philosopher in Netherlands, which is the paper I replied to. And then we'll proceed to my suggested areas of expansion and for the conclusion or wrapping up of everything. Okay. So the goal of this reply paper is to simply suggest possible further areas of expansion for the new feminist critique on pornography as a reply to Coston, so as also to help those feminists who write or critique, write critiques on pornography. Okay. So first, hey, let's have a brief introduction. In 2019, Amanda Coston from Tilburg University, Never ne Netherlands, wrote a paper entitled The Feminist Case Against Pornography, a Review and Reevaluation. In this paper, she revisited and critiqued three common arguments used by the anti-porn feminists, aka APFs, to argue against pornography. So these are the three common ineffective arguments, according to Coston, used by APFs. First, highlighting the harm or suffering associated with pornography, arguing that it has a causal relationship with rape or sexual violence. Second, arguing that it violates women's right to free speech. And third, equating pornography to sex in the context of patriarchy, thus furthering inequality and women's subjugation. So to briefly present her refutations, here are, here are they, here are the following. For arguments one and two, Costin argues that Rape and sexual violence are not essential aspects to pornography. In fact, there exists a case of so-called soft pornography, which does not involve or romanticizing or fantasizing rape and sexual violence. Same goes for the second argument, wherein not all productions of pornography are done by coercing women. Some productions are done with the women's full consent. In fact, they would even argue that it is something empowering for them. And the case of Netherlands, which is a very liberal country with a widespread access to pornography, actually shows a very low case of sexual violence and rape. So therefore, Coston argues that it is actually hard to argue that there is a causal relationship with pornography and sexual violence. So she only argues that there is a, only a correlative relationship between porn and rape or sexual violence. So take note, causal versus correlative. And third, for the third argument, for her, the problem with this argument is that it equates sex, it, it constantly argues that sex automatically means misogyny in the perspective of females. In other words, it seems to automatically assume that the males are the more dominant ones and that in sex, the women are subjugated. When in fact, that is um, refuted by some my numerous women who claim that sex is an empowering or liberating activity for them. So that refutes the misconceived notion that sex is always under the context of patriarchy and misogyny. Second, it also tries to perpetuate the sex equals immoral notion often pushed by conservatives, when in fact there's been growing studies on, on, on sex in the 
previous decades, even in the Catholic context, which actually argues that sex is good, although how they define good differs based on different schools of thoughts. Overall, there exists an egalitarian or soft pornography, which all of these notions are not present. Rape, sexual violence, violating free speech, etc. So therefore, the case of soft pornography automatically refutes these, these arguments and actually helps the pro-pornography um, crowd to argue that pornography is okay. Overall, what for Coston, what makes the three arguments ineffective is that it focuses on the pornographic object itself. So for Coston, the new argument, the new feminist critique on pornography should focus the critical gaze, I should shift, the, the, the critical gaze should shift from the pornographic object to the male consumers and per, of pornography and the attitude such consumption reflects and conceals. So I would like to take note here that the focus of Coston's paper are, is only on male consumers. So for Coston, the consumption of pornography among males reflects sexist attitudes and conceals them. For Coston, to quote, we should think of pornography as an externalized form of prostitution, specifically a practice that allows externalized expression of the attitudes associated with prostitution. How, what does she mean by this? Okay, she made a comparison between Johns. Johns are males who are quote unquote buyers or consumers of prostitutes. She argues that they actually expressed similar sexual attitudes as male porn consumers. How is this, how does this work? Okay, in case you know the striking similarity between the attitudes of Johns and male consumers, both of which express domination, exploitation, and objectification, all of which are sex, sexist in nature. Furthermore, there is more social disapproval of Johns as compared to male consumers and how the latter, the male porn consumers, do not feel or recognize that their behavior expresses power and domination, lack of empathy, or an indication of their objectification of women. And a major factor as to why it seems that there is a greater social disapproval of Johns and a seemingly growth, greater social approval of male porn consumers is that there is a distance between the male and the female consumer, uh, the female in the pornographic object. In other words, the male watching pornography and the woman being performed or the him consuming or watching, there is a distance. Unlike in prostitution where there is a direct contact between the male and the female, the prostitute. So because of this, it makes it seem more acceptable, the distance. That males consuming pornography. So in brief, Coston argues that pornography consumption is a practice which reflects the same sexist attitudes as seen in buying sex or prostitution, and that such sexist attitudes are concealed because of the nature of pornography, wherein there's a distance between a male consumer and a female object. So it makes the consumer feel less aware of the sexism his consumption reflects. So given that, given Coston's new feminist critique on pornography, I decided to suggest further areas of expansion so as to help expound the feminist critique on pornography. First, on female consumers. First, I'd like to, add, to suggest that um, why not try talking about the effect of pornography on female consumers too, since pornography consumption is not exclusive to females. The number one challenge for APFs like Coston and others is that pornog is the notion that pornography is quote and unquote empowering to women, according to the studies of Atwood, Smith, and, and Barker and Marx. That is the biggest challenge for APFs. For example, in the study of Atwood, Smith, and Barker, four women were all interviewed and all claimed to consume pornograph pornography regularly for various reasons. Okay. And for the study of Marx, 26 Canadian women were interviewed about their perceptions. And they, their findings challenge the, the notion that pornography is female degradation as based on a radical feminist discourse. And another study from, from Matibo et al. is that pornography actually affects sex women's sexual views and lifestyle. For example, higher rate of sexual activities for consumers. Now, as to whether they feel empowered or not is beyond Matibo et al.'s scope and limitations, but for these two, they both argue, both of their results claim that 
pornography is actually empowering to women. So that is a challenge. So therefore, given these three findings, feminist critiques may use this as a springboard to analyze further the attitudes of female consumers and try comparing them to males as, a, as to whether they, do they exhibit the same sexist attitude as males or not, or if such attitudes of women are also concealed by pornography and whether it contributes to their gender hegemony or not. Next on varying degree, genre, genres of pornography. We all know that there are now new genres of pornography, queer pornography, feminist pornography, lesbian, gay, etc. Most of which are often overlooked or excluded in feminist discourses in pornography. In fact, Hosson herself clearly stated in, at the beginning of her paper that the focus of her critique is only on heterosexual pornography and its male consumers. So given this, maybe it might be good to tackle the varying genres, so particularly how it could further expound the feminist critique on pornography, particularly in how it affects consumer behaviors, since the focus of Costum's perspective are the consumers. The, studies, the study of McCutcheon and Bishop studied 14 women's perception of gay pornography. They had a generally percep positive perception about it, but they elicited negative stereotypes on gay men. But one of the notable reasons why they consume is power dynamics, because they seem to perceive gay pornography as having a better atmosphere of equality, since the performers are of the same sex, unlike in heterosexual porn, where there seems to be a power competition between men and women performers. Next, for Cornu et al., it's basically the same. He all, um, they also studied 974 users of porn in Canada, particularly gay porn. And they, their perspectives are quite complex. It was a mixture of positive and negative. Therefore, the findings of these two studies may allow feminist critiques to further expound the, the feminist critique on pornography by exploring and analyzing the attitudes of the consumers and even the pornographic object itself, given its difference from heterosexual pornography. Okay, for the, my second to the last point, the pornified or hypersexualized culture. It might be good to explore as well whether Pornography has a causal or a correlative relation to the hypersexualized culture. And where the continuous proliferation, proliferation and open access to pornographic magazines or lab mags actually contribute to the prevalence of such sexist attitudes. This is according to a study by Mooney in 2008 in London, UK. Lab mags have known to normalize pornography and culture, particularly by forcing women to achieve their so-called real representation by being a sexual object for men furthering the hegemonic norm. Okay, according to Gail Dines, a uh, popular APF, and Professor Robert Jensen, pornography undermines the Me Too movement. And it is where males first learn to control women for their sexual pleasure and intensify the, intensify the message of male dominance, further, further perpetuating the hypersexualized culture. So the question remains, is pornography the cause of this hypersexualized culture, or is it just one of the many factors, hence a correlation? Lastly, for the reduction of consumption. Cosson highlighted that pornography is not simply a one form of sexist oppression among a myriad of others, which does not deserve attention, and that rather, it is a particularly insidious social practice that functions to conceal and normalize sexism. So the bigger question is whether the reduction of its consumption by males would actually reduce to attitudes, to sexist attitudes. No, by reduction, just to clarify, I, we don't mean censorship. Because censorship has not, been, has not known to be a good idea when it comes to tackling pornography. So it was identified that pornography is one of the major variables which increases the likelihood of men objectifying women, particularly through body evaluation and making unwanted sexual advances, both rooted in their adherence to traditional masculine gender adherence, particularly playboy attitudes, power over women and violence. Therefore, therefore, the study of Mikorsky and Szymanski stressed the need to highlight pornography and in applying interventions aimed to reduce men's sexual objectification of women. And next, for the study of Seabrook, Ward, and Gicardi, consumption of pornography is associated with a greater acceptance of objectification of women and rape myth acceptance. And lastly, this one, for my last point here, in the case of Japan, Professor Gilliot, in an opinion piece in the Japan, Japan Times, noted that Japan's female objectifying culture in which pornography in a different form, hentai art, is one of the factors blamed for its perpetuation. Although it is, a it is a global problem, he recognized that, what sets Japan apart is that many young women seem to accept and emulate this objectified image of themselves. 
And lastly, another study from Norma and Morita, the greatest foe of the anti-porn feminist movement in Japan is pornography. So the aforementioned opinion, mentioned opinion piece, aforementioned opinion, opinion piece and study goes to show how pornography is a major factor in perpetuating the, perpetuating the sexist and women objectifying culture in Japan. So given these claims, the new feminist critique on pornography might look into these and analyze and answer the question as to whether redu reducing con pornography consumption would decrease the instances of sexist attitudes among men as well as, well as unmasking it or its unmasking or concealment. But to conclude, the three main points mentioned are suggested by men, or rather four, I'm sorry, four main points mentioned are suggested possible areas for further discussion on the new feminist critique on pornography based on Costa's attitudinal approach. That those four points are attitudes of female consumers of pornography, the varying genres of pornography, such as gay, lesbian porn, the nature of its connection to the hypersexualized culture, and whether the reduction of its consumption would lead to the decrease of sexist attitudes. And lastly, the writer of this paper categorically sides and agrees with Costin. In fact, I find her new feminist critique quite groundbreaking, I would say. But I believe that once these underlying questions I've suggested have been settled and clarified to, a more sustainable and expounded feminist critique of pornography could be explored and established. Lastly, Costin clarified as well that her critique or study is not meant to compete with other critiques, but rather it is meant to complement them even the critiques focusing on the pornographic object and not on the consumers. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rodney. Uh, may we call on um, Dr. Gina Apiniano to take care of the uh, open forum. Good morning. Uh, sorry about that. Dr. Jean is having some technical difficulties. Uh, may we call on Dr. Joaquin instead um, to take care of the open forum. Hello. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good night for everyone. So, let's start with the open forum for this uh, segment. Okay. Uh, for the speakers, please open your video so that people will see who you are again. Okay. Wait. Okay, let's start with a question coming from uh, Jonathan James O'Canete. I think he's from DLSU. So for the first speaker, namely Aaron. Could it be possible that a video game avatar is a virtual representation of the real self of the player? Can there be a possibility that a video game avatar's sense of self is being embodied in the real and concrete by the player himself? So let's start with that question first. Okay, thank you. Uh, for that first question, my answer is yes. Uh, the real or authentic self can be represented. However, please uh, be reminded that the game also allows the player to experience different viewpoints and narratives in a safe space that is otherwise limited outside of the game. 
Mm -hmm. That's my answer for the course, first question. Okay, so the other question will be, uh, is there a possibility that an existential frustration on the part of the player due to the fact that what is seemingly impossible in the material world becomes palatable or possible in the cyber world? So in, in this question, I'm not really sure what he mean, you mean by existential frustration, but I'm just going to connect it with, I guess, gender, uh, uh, identity conflict, I guess, because somehow if it's in connection with the first question that let's say you are, uh, you have this certain gender identity and then you play the game and now you have access to different roles and so you could form different identities with different narratives and performances and you would now be in conflict with what you, what your identity is supposed to be and that's the goal of, of performativity, or of the theory of performativity, and also with video games, is that uh, there is access to gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you uh, a sense of leeway into uh, understanding different narratives and experiences. And so you don't get, uh, it it's actually challenges certain heter heteronormative uh, standards as well. So that's my answer for my, the second question. Okay, very good. So for the second speaker, namely Francis, now is the gender galaxy model of Joaquin and Vienna in the gender galaxy model of Joaquin and Vienna? That's me, pala. Could there be an instance where a fusion of horizon can happen? Is the idea of a contextualized approach towards understanding the galaxies respectively signify absolute distinctiveness and the impossibility for a conoia, conoia coming together to exist. Is there a possibility of fusion of horizons here? Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that question. Uh, by, <clears throat> by fusion of horizons, do you mean um, an overlap of uh, two distinct uh, gender galaxies? Is that what you're asking? Is it possible for two uh, independent galaxies to overlap i think yeah i think that's the the main idea whether there's a fusion of these mm -hmm. galaxies yeah. well um in itself based on uh, my reading of uh, dr bian and dr Joaquin's paper um the the galaxies themselves do not overlap but that doesn't mean that a person cannot identify with the two galaxies, for example, if um, I could identify with the trans, uh, trans, trans galaxy, and at the same time, I could also identify with the queer galaxy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, that's the best fusion. That's the best um, take I can give on uh, regarding the fusion of horizons happening. Mm -hmm. So with regards to the second question, does being does uh, us positing independent galaxies lead to the impossibility of uh, coming together? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. Um, which, uh, uh, I would think that Dr. Bian and Dr. Joaquin uh, proposed this uh, model because they just want um, each they, they just want to highlight that each um, gender category has their own unique um, set of concerns, needs, and whatnot, their own unique identity, but as uh, stated in their defini definition, each gender galaxy is part of, the, of an entire uh, gender galaxy. So in a way, although independent tayo, independent yung galaxy ng, for example, ng straights, uh, gays, uh, lesbians, mm -hmm. interconnected pa din tayo in such a way na we all belong in a single vast gender galaxy. Right. I think that's the model we're trying to propose as well. I, I love your take, Pala. Regards, uh, Francis. That's a good presentation. Um, I just wonder whether it's my personal or personal take on your uh, criticism, which is well, good uh, observation. But I wonder whether your idea of signifiers and recognition really would be vital in social recognition. Just a follow up concerning that. 
uh, <clears throat> yes, sir. Because um, because I argue that, for example, it does when uh, when talking about signifiers, I'm talking in this case about obviously clothes or colors, the visible ones. But we can also talk about um, recognition in terms of you recognize, for example, yun nga, societal concerns or issues or political goals. Mm -hmm. So what if what if those goals become overly identified with the galaxy? So would that necessarily mean that, for example, members of that galaxy who do not share those aspirations, those, go those goals, does that mean that they're not legitimate members of that galaxy? So that's, uh, that's the line of thinking, um, that's the thought process that I um, came up with regarding that. I just uh, used visible signifiers because uh, it's one of the easiest, most um, measurable uh, ways wherein we can um, identify people. Okay. Uh, for the third speaker, Rodney from Jai Lim. I think pornographic videos are the representations of what, in real life, male and female, especially a couple, do. Looking at the different pornographic videos, pornography seems to be a job. No one could ever go for free sex unless he or she has a girlfriend or boyfriend or wife or husband. Well, what's your reaction to this? Thank you very much, Sir, sir Joaquin, and to G. Lim for your comment. Okay. I think the notion that pornographic videos are representations of what in real life male and female couples do, I think that has, that's a, quite a subject for debate because in some schools of thought, they actually blame pornography as one of the causes of divorce. Why? It's because oftentimes, for, in the case of the males, because of their addiction, or if not addiction, frequent consumption of pornography, it gives them... Um, it, it gives them unrealistic expectations of what to experience in sex, particularly with their wives or with their partners in the case of the unmarried. So therefore, I think um, for one to say that it is a representation of what in real life, what real life couples do, I don't think that's the case. And in fact, in some APF schools of thought, they... Um, a male and a female couple watching porn together, they don't see it romantic. They even, they even note that it is quite similar to what child pornographers do or child rapists do, watching porn together with their victim. Mm -hmm. And um, no one could ever go for free sex unless he or she has a girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, or husband. Well, good point, but we might need to remember that free sex, quote-unquote, needs to be consented, okay? And it, it shouldn't be forced. And um, unless she has a free girlfriend, has but yeah, but sometimes you can also get free sex, quote unquote, if it's a case of casual sex, wherein you're not in a relationship, but you just want to experience the act, and it's both consensual. Mm -hmm. So that's my reaction to her. To is this his or her comment? Um, I don't know. Okay, so for mm -hmm. Francis again from Doctor Eva, Luang, what are the educational implications? of seeing of are you seeing and putting these orientation in galaxies thank you dr calling uh, for that question yeah so i think that's a good question um can these um gender galaxies be applied educationally for example for example when teaching um, gender studies um yeah i think um this uh, this uh, ontology uh, proposed by Dr. Biani Joaquin would help students um, understand the importance of um, distinguishing each gender category from one another mm -hmm. as a unique as a unique community that that although they're part of the LGBTQ community as a whole, uh, the the proposed um, model by uh, Dr. Bian and Joaquin actually allows us to delve to dive deeper into each uh, into each gender category. So, for example, uh, if we teach in a school about lesbians, we can uh, we can uh, apply this uh, ontology uh, so in such a way that uh, 
we can expose what what makes what are the problems that are unique to lesbians what are the problems unique to gays so on and so forth so i think that's a that's a good educational implication that i see uh, in terms of the this uh, gender galaxy model okay thanks for that um Here's another question. I think this is for all of you. How should philosophical organizations such as the PAP find these representations, these uh, gender representations, problematic? How would these organizations respond to these problematic representations? Let's start with Aaron. Um, for me, I think we should have uh, God policies, gender and development policies, mm -hmm. or guidelines to uh, uh, or more gender related programs such as this. This seminar is, I think, would be a start, uh, would be really helpful uh to to provide uh awareness mm -hmm. so again uh policies awareness raising and um gender related programs okay so how about That's rodney yeah thanks aaron how about rodney thank you very much doc Joaquin. um i maybe based on what my study what i can suggest for the pap is that like what Aaron said, maybe they could also, these feminist critiques, particularly in the context of pornography, they might use them as the basis for coming up with policies. Mm -hmm. Or if possible, if it is, I don't know if it is in line with PAP's goal or objective, but maybe they could make a stand on what is their real stand on pornography or other gender, female or male gender representations. While taking a stand does not necessarily mean that you're going to close doors for criticism because it defeats the purpose of the, or the organization. But maybe, um, if not taking a stand, they could also use this feminist critique by Coston on pornography as a gateway for other, other feminist scholars or researchers to further study on the subject of pornography. Say, for example, they could, you guys could... Um, open a seminar like this revolving around the theme of pornography or you could also promote her critique in a way that could it be further expounded or is there any flaws are there any flaws or mistakes in her critique mm -hmm. or is it does it have a good objective basis or is it has it is it actually tackling questions which have already been tackled by other studies things like that so that is what i suggest uh, thanks, Rodney. How about Francis? Okay. So, with respect to PAP and organizations in general, uh, conducting seminars like this is a start. Um, getting speakers to talk about issues in presentation, gender, feminist issues, uh, that's a good way to start. But I think we can go uh, deeper in terms of uh, the educational system itself. Mm. So you notice that um, in schools, for example, in the uh, Sal, let's take the Sal, gender studies is only offered as a one subject, some subject lang, and it's not available across all courses. So before I was an engineering student, there was no gender studies in, uh, in engineering. So that, uh, that, formed, uh, that, that, that impacted a lot on me. Mm -hmm. So once I shifted to liberal arts, the na ako expose mas lalo sa mga tinga, gender studies, gender sensitivity, so on and so forth. So I think uh, in addition to these uh, seminars, to, to these fans, we can also go to the educational system itself to educate the students uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding the issues on uh, gender, feminism, and so on and so forth. Yeah, thanks for those uh, comments and. Uh, highlights. 
Actually, we're doing that. That's why we have this kind of activity. We have been doing these activities for the past few years because we want to educate people. We want them to be socially aware of what's going on in terms of gender or oppression brought about by gender uh, inequalities and so on. Okay. Are there any more questions from our audience? Uh, here's another question. Uh, what about the case of, for, the, for Rodney, I think, what about the case of partners who are pornographic stars? What a case who are pornographic stars? Partners who are pornographic stars? Yeah. Well, I'm, I must admit that that is beyond the scope and limitations of my study. So maybe you could use that as another springboard to expound the feminist critique on pornography. Mm -hmm. But... Um, as for them being pornographic stars, well, if it if they're one hundred percent okay with it, if it works for them, okay, good for them. If they're remaining faithful to each other, although it seems unimaginable for me, but for the other case, we cannot also deny the fact that sometimes pornography has been blamed to be a destroyer of marriage, and um, okay, as I was stated by one comment here, they get educated female married friends. They watch videos just to educate. Okay, good that they feel get educated, but how about the women, the wives who actually feel left out and who actually feel insulted because their husbands need to actually find another woman just to satisfy, just to, for, for them to quote-unquote consume or just to satisfy their sexual urges and vice versa. So those are many factors which might um, come into play as well. So in other words, what works for one may not necessarily work for all. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me turn you over to uh, Gina for some announcements. Gina, are you here? Sorry, good morning. Okay. So thank you very much for the participation of um, the three speakers. And to the other participants, um, thank you very much. So in, in a little while, I'll be sharing the evaluation link for today's activity, but before that, um, let me just share the call for membership to the PAP organization. Um, membership is still open and um, there's a registration form for this purpose and the membership fee. Okay, so that's the membership link which you can find in Facebook page. And then call for abstracts for an upcoming world conference for women's studies. The theme is environment and gender equity in the post-COVID world. Um, abstracts are accepted until September 30. So the deadline will be on the 30th of September at 11.59 p.m. New York. CT time. The conference dates will be October 30 to 31, 2020. 
So if for those interested, you may email your abstract to .cws at gmail.com. So there, these are um, the themes or sub themes for the conference. And then please like our Facebook group, or I mean, join the Facebook group. It's um, Facebook name is Philosophical Association of the Philippines. PAP Incorporated. All right. So this is the link to the evaluation um, of the event um, for those who would like to receive their e-certificate. I'll be sharing the evaluation link in the chat box. Chat box in a little while. All right. So thank you for joining. Uh, we hope to see you in the next PAP event. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, and thank you to all our participants. Um, for the closing remarks, may I call on Dr. Jeremiah Joaquin, the President of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. Okay. So hello again. So just to close this program, it's, it's one of the hopes of BAP as an organization to educate people about gender, uh, equality and issues about gender and any sort of oppression because of inequalities of identity. So I hope that you have learned a lot from this webinar. Actually, it's a feminar because it's a feminist seminar. And we have a lot of things in store for you. One of the things that will come up in the next few months will be the PAP's General Assembly. So please do join the PAP organization and be a member because we will have a general assembly by November 15, I think. We'll make the proper announcement. We'll, uh, we'll announce the winners of some of our activities like um, the Isabella de los Reyes um, essay prize. We will also announce the winner of the first PAP public intellectual prize. And of course, uh, we will have an election. So we will call for nominations in the next few weeks. Uh, for the next uh, set of board members of the PAP. So to close, thank you very much for everyone who's here and for those who are watching on Facebook, and we'll see you again next time. Cheers.